Hello, I'm Megan Parham and I'm a PhD candidate from the University of Alberta. And I'm gonna to talk today about my dissertation research, which is tentatively called Click Me Literary Hypertext as Illness Narrative for Women with Hyperandrogenism. In The Wounded Storyteller, Arthur Frank wrote that major illness has the potential to disrupt the planned destination of our life. And that through the practice of illness narrative, we're able to actually reclaim the telling of our stories. Scholarship on illness narratives or autobiographical accounts of the experience of illness show that they're especially transformative for marginalized groups as an accessible way to bring agency and voice to the body. Hyperandrogenism, for anyone who isn't familiar, uh, is a medical condition characterized by excessive levels of male hormones. There's a lot of uh, scare quotes around these uh, binary terms. Um, so excessive levels of male hormones, such as testosterone, which when identified in the female body are associated with masculinizing symptoms. Uh, so this can include excess body and facial hair, male pattern baldness, infertility, elevated sex drive, increased muscle mass, and absence of menstrual bleeding. Hyperandrogenism has actually been weaponized as a justification to call into question which bodily signifiers and hormonal nuances ultimately quantify biological sex. So for example, you might be familiar with the ongoing battle between uh, South African track star Castor Semenya and the International Association of Athletics Federations. After her 2016 Olympic gold medal, Semenya was mandated by the IAAF to undergo a sex verification test. The test indicated that Semenya had elevated testosterone and her results were made public. From there, the IAAF mandated that Semenya had to actually pharmaceutically lower her natural levels of testosterone in order to compete in the women's category of her sport. And this is a decision that she's actively trying to reverse. And just for context, um, the IAAF has actually never mandated men to pharmaceutically lower their natural levels of testosterone. So we can see that this is a gender issue and this is also a race issue that we need to think about. So medical literature describes that the aesthetic symptoms of hyperandrogenism are actually quite benign. Yet in clinical practice, women diagnosed with hyperandrogenism are prescribed antiandrogens or else advised of cosmetic solutions, including, including laser hair removal, uh, medication for male pattern hair loss, such as Rogaine, and bleaching creams in order to ultimately restore feminine embodiment. So the research I did in my MA was actually around identifying how some women with hyperandrogenism, because, because of their experiences of perceived subjugation in the medical encounter, um, were turning to online health forms to actually write about their experiences. And in these online forms, women were becoming experts in their, in their disease. And then they were actually disseminating this information to other women to read. Um, they were rehearsing speeches with other women on what to say to doctors in order to be prescribed certain medications. Um, and they were just you know, writing poetry and sharing their narratives in this digital space. So from there, the question for me became, you know, what, what's next for digital illness narratives? So my project now is turning towards the intersection of health and digital humanities, and I'm questioning what the future of illness narratives may look like. The discipline of illness narratives um, has been typically, you know, taken up as a written book, right? So, you know, thinking about and theorizing about written memoirs and autobiographies, etc. But I actually wasn't seeing a lot of written books about the experience of hyperandrogenism specifically. And I found that a lot of this had to do with accessibility for marginalized individuals. So I had to consider, you know, who had access to publishing practices, for example. Or I also had to consider time, right? So 
you know, sitting and writing a full length book could be potentially very ableist and uh, individuals living with illness may not have the capacity to do this. So the issue for me became considering how illness narrative books have, you know, all this literature supporting how transformative they can be for the author. Um, however, there is this issue of access. Um, so now I'm trying to consider, you know, how I can reimagine the illness narrative book in the online space in a way that is perhaps more accessible. Other questions that I'm considering right now are, you know, what kinds of platforms or digital tools might be used to hone in on those very uh, therapeutic aspects of the illness memoir, for example. Or how can digital tools be used in ways that are effective for subjugated women to write a path to health empowerment? So ultimately, this project that I'm doing considers how we might actually code health liberation into the digital uh, through literary hypertext technology. Uh, so literary hypertext is a form of rhizomatic digital story writing that calls on readers to participate in the narratives unfolding by selecting different hyperlinks. Uh, literary hypertext can take different forms, but a lot of what exists on the internet can be described as a sort of cross between a story and a video game uh, with a choose your own adventure style slant. So I'm just gonna give a little insight into how dynamic literary hypertext can be. Um, I'm gonna show some screenshots of a couple story games that you can actually find online today. So this is a screenshot from a game called Queers in Love at the End of the World. Um, so as the reader, you have 10 seconds to choose how you want to interact with your lover before the whole world is ultimately wiped away. So that's mainly a textual based game that I have here. Um, but, you know, there's also uh, very visual based games that we can play as well. Um, I'm going to show a couple screenshots here. Um, so this is a game called Incubus. It was created by an amazing artist from the UK whose name is Christine Wilkes um, that I'm working with on another project. Um, but Incubus is a 3D immersive fiction where you get to play as a mostly unseen teenage girl. Um, you, as a reader player, navigate a childhood bedroom before you actually plunge into this very disorientating uh, space that looks like the fleshy inside canals of the human body. And we can see these canals in this bottom photo here. Um, in your quest through these canals, you have to actually shoot down fragments of cyberbullying text with balls of light. So Incubus really questions, you know, what it means to be a girl coming of age in digital culture and dealing with these notions of the feminine ideal. Literary hypertext has been taken up in scholarship as mostly a fiction-based medium, but the literature shows that this medium actually has so much potential as a therapeutic tool for body-based concerns because of its ability to make these unique connections between ideas. Um, it encourages integrative thought and it supports collaborative learning. But the real magic of literary hypertext, I think, is that um, you have the ability to write your own story. And you can actually do that with a software called Twine. So this is uh, where I'll get into access, how literary hypertext or uh, the virtual book can have uh, more access options for marginalized individuals. So Twine is one platform for writing literary hypertext. It's freely accessible. It's open sourced. Um, it allows people to create literary hypertext stories in their browser uh, with no coding knowledge at all. And they can actually publish their story directly to HTML. So Twine was developed by interactive fiction author Chris Clemis in 2009. And ultimately his intention was to reduce barriers to entry for game creators of marginalized identities. And Twine has come to be described by scholars as a predominantly um, queer and women dominated community, which is really cool. 
So there's some scholarship on twine and literary hypertext, um, but it's concentrated in the discipline of game studies mainly. And there's limited research on the potential for literary hypertext as a therapeutic tool for writing illness narratives. So in the research that I'm conducting, I'm evaluating what value a nonlinear digital storytelling tool such as Twine holds um, as an avenue for women with hyperandrogenism to write their body and to write their experiential based uh, narrative. So I'm currently in the experiment phase of this research. I've recruited uh, 10 participants who self-identify as having hyperandrogenism. And these participants have completed a two hour virtual module that includes uh, creative uh, writing exercises and a twine writing tutorial. Participants have then actually submitted their own twine stories um, to me that they have created in this uh, module. And they've been guided by a writing prompt uh, that is, you know, describe what it feels like to live in a body with hyperandrogenism. So I created this module using Twine uh, to showcase to participants, you know, what kinds of capabilities Twine has and how dynamic it can be. Um, so if you do have some skill in uh, coding or just some previous knowledge, uh, you can actually incorporate sounds and images. Um, although the tutorial that I gave um, is extremely basic and it's very uh, beginner friendly. So you don't need to have any of that knowledge. So the module consists of five parts. So information on hyperandrogenism, twinery.org, and then we get into storyboarding uh, the participants' own illness narratives. Uh, there's a twine tutorial, and finally building their own story in twine with a writing prompt. And I just wanna outline some components of the twine tutorial that I made um, to show uh, how it works essentially. All right. so. The first thing I want to talk about is uh, that it's it's extremely interactive uh, twine. So I've actually coded in mechanisms where participants can actually self generate content. Um, so we have this page here that says, let's start by entering your name. So I can type in my name. I press OK. Get going. Hi, Megan. So the system can read what I typed in and it'll feed it back to me at various times throughout the module to make it feel more interactive that you're more connected in this space, which is really cool. Um, the next thing that it can do is that it really has this capacity or capability to be rhizomatic. And that's really the heart of what literary hypertext is, is that you can have multiple endings, uh, different branching plot lines. Um, and I really wanted to showcase this uh, for the participants um, and showcase how they can do this in their own stories. So Twine is a free user-friendly digital tool for nonlinear writing. When I say nonlinear, I'll show you what I mean. So you click on what I mean. So once upon a time, Megan was walking through the woods. Suddenly they came across a fork in the path ahead. So which way do you turn? Left or right? So this is where uh, the reader player gets to interact with the rhizomatic structure of the game. So if we pick left, so it begins to storm above as heavy rain falls around your feet. You notice the path beginning to flood. But what happens if we would have went right? And I wanna show the participants this. So go right. So your walk is sunny and warm. You pick raspberries and you eat them from the bush. Move on. So it says you're ultimately building a story and twine can be about choice. And I wanted to showcase that. And finally, uh, the tutorial that I uh, build here gives a behind the scenes look at how twine stories can be structured in different ways. So we have different uh, ways that we can structure a story. The first one is a forward path. So we see here, it's very linear. So your story moves the author through a straight line. This module um, you are doing right now is an example of a mainly forward path. 
The intention of a forward path is that every reader will have the same experience with your story. In our Twine interface, a forward path would look something like this. You can see each passage moves on to a single next passage. But you can also have a weaving path. So your story branches out with different hypertext passages, but ultimately comes back to a single path. In our Twine interface, a weaving path could look something like this. So we see uh, a forward path emerging at the beginning, but all of a sudden um, it branches into two different passages. And this is where you can have um, alternate outcomes in a story. And finally, multiple paths. So your story has different paths for the reader to follow. Each path has a different plot and possibly a different ending to the story. Multiple paths are more complex to make and take a bit more time, but they can be interesting for our workshop to play through different scenarios or dream up alternative ways things could have been. So we see in the outline here that you start with one passage, but immediately it branches us to three different options. Within those three different options, you have multiple branches as well. So there's so much possibility um, in this structure to build multiple uh, debating paths within your narrative structure. Right now, I actually have nine out of 10 participants um, who have completed the study. Uh, from those who have completed their stories, there has been some really interesting findings, um, and I'm going to just mention briefly three of them. Uh, this is just a screenshot from the tutorial where um, they build their, their story with this writing prompt here that I mentioned. All right, so one of those findings is alluding to the very unique structure of literary hypertext as resembling the human thought process. Um, and what I mean by this is participants have noted that they enjoyed writing their narratives with the rhizomatic web-like capabilities of Twine because in their words, it mirrors the way that we think. So I'll just move my picture so you can see. So it mirrors the way that we think. So instead of starting their story at the beginning and then moving sequentially to an ending, participants identified with being able to tell their stories in a way that matches how they think. With ideas being linked potentially thematically, uh, but not necessarily in a linear way. Um, so they can write a story that perhaps hops around, that takes detours, and possibly doesn't have a clear beginning or ending. In the same vein, participants have also noted something that I think is really fascinating, that writing illness narratives or stories in Twine actually matches the feeling that you get when, you, when you're diagnosed with an illness. Um, so one participant put it that when you hear the news that you're sick or that you have a disorder, it feels like your brain sort of explodes with new avenues that you have to explore. And this goes back to Arthur's, Arthur Frank's argument that illness disrupts the planned destination of our life. So it's no longer this sort of straight path that we once thought. Now our life's trajectory is actually exploded into a web of endless possibilities that we have to explore. Or in other words, it's exploded into the unknown, um, which matches the twine structure that you can create. Um, and finally, participants made discoveries about themselves and their experiences through Twine's hyperlink feature. So participants spoke about how they had never made the connection in their mind about how certain experiences that they had were actually connected to each other until they saw that physical link between both of those passages through a word that they chose to hyperlink. And what I mean by this, uh, I'll give an example is, um, a participant might notice that they used the word shame, for example, as a hyperlink uh, in multiple passages. These passages would then become physically linked to each other in the Twine interface. Then all of a sudden, we might be able to recognize that these two separate experiences that we had that we thought maybe weren't connected, we can see that they were actually connected through the sentiment, the feeling, the affect, and also the hyperlink of shame, and we can make that connection. Um, so seeing that physical link allowed them to explore the narrative connection of their experiences. Um, so that is the current status of my research. Um, I'm excited to continue this work and explore more findings throughout the duration of this project. Um, this is just the recruitment poster here if anyone's interested. Uh, thank you so much for listening.